What's up, YouTube world? Welcome back to my YouTube channel. I'm Jesse Vasquez, and we have Connor, who is with me today. And we're actually, this is basically a part two of what we talked about, what, Connor, about a year ago, right? About, a year, a, about a year ago. Yeah, so for people that are looking to go after travel medical professionals, Connor is actually a travel medical nurse, travel medical professional. So I really like the insightfulness that he has both on the clinical side and also on the real estate side because he's an investor. So if you're looking to invest specifically to have travel medical professionals and you're thinking about all the new headlines that have been out as far as nurses quitting, nurses leaving on assignment, all those things, you're probably going to watch this video all the way to the end because we're going to talk about three things that are incredibly important if you're going to start out in this space. So Please watch it through through the end. Connor, let's jump right into this, man. So a lot has changed since you've been here with me. Obviously, COVID has come through and completely sh has shown the entire U.S. and the world, frankly, that there is a travel nursing demand. There's a need. There's not enough clinicians to meet the supply of patients. Um, in fact, I still think that there's issues on that end. But there's also new articles that are coming out that are saying assignments are canceled. They're not paying the nurses as much money. And for me, in this discussion right now, I really want to talk about is nursing, uh, housing, travel medical professionals or the industry still a good play? So if you want to talk to us right now about trends that you're seeing and maybe some assignments that you're taking right now and what that actually looks like, let's break into that for a moment. If you want to tell people who you are and we'll kind of get into that subject there. Sure. So my name's Connor, guys. I uh, I have been a nurse now for four years, primarily ICU nursing. Uh, I, I got into real estate investing pretty much from the beginning of my nursing career. Uh, I started by house hacking and that kind of developed over time. I furnished the place in the gener in the common areas for my upstairs tenants. And then uh, that kind of evolved, uh, I guess, in February or no, in, in, in November of, I guess it was 2020, I took Jesse's course and was introduced to the to essentially housing travel medical professionals like myself. And that kind of uh, opened my eyes, if you will, to, to housing some of my colleagues and that, uh, you know, I, I was in the space. I knew kind of the style, uh, the location, and most importantly, how much money nurses made um, in North Carolina and in California. Those were the those were the areas that I grew up in and also worked in. So I was able to kind of target location specifically, um, Raleigh, Durham, North Carolina. That's where I started, um, and that kind of progressed uh, into Cal or back to California, where I grew up and where I live now kind of what's gone on in terms of covid you know we were we were seeing nurses making six six to ten thousand dollars a week that is that's that's huge money for crazy for nursing and now cool. um you know covid covid is ending which is which is a positive thing for the world however I, what i have seen is essentially hospitals are not wanting to to pay contract nurses or travel nurses as much so they're really tightening their belt in terms of how many travels travelers they're they're taking on and what they're paying those travelers. So what a, a lot of people don't understand is you know you you have to think about that uh, when when you're renting when you're renting to those travelers you're maybe not able to command a high price directly to them so you may have to have other strategies like corporate housing providing housing to insurance claimees or going directly to the travelers agencies themselves who are tech or maybe a little less price sensitive than the actual individual nurse. Yeah, that's a good point, Connor. Because, you know, there's a lot of people now that are like that. Their goal, Connor, is just like, I just want to go after travel nurses. Great industry. It's it's a massive, it's a $20 billion industry. For those of you who don't know, it's it's massive. And this is just a, the, the clinical, the travel nursing side. $20 billion, It's That's huge. But you need to have different eggs to put your baskets in, like Connor just mentioned right now. If for whatever reason, say you're in a local hospital and you have 20 units there and all 20 of those are for travel medical professionals, and all of a sudden, this that hospital decides to only hire um, folks that are in their market instead of outsourcing, then you're in a big problem. So you always want to make sure that you have different avatars. So thanks for bringing that up. Sorry to cut you. I just want to make sure that we highlight these certain certain things. Because I hear a lot of people talking to me about that, where they're only going to go after nurses. And I'm just like, hey, hey, great industry, but you got to make sure that you have exit strategies and don't put your eggs all in that industry basket. Mm -hmm. So essentially, that that's kind of how how I got started. That has has sit, has. Also, I've been, I've learned how to incorporate other real estate investing strategies like development, which I'm not going to go too much into today. But um, that's something that I I wouldn't have been exposed to unless I started in in buying my first rental property. So, you know, one of the things that I, that I'll say is, guys, there's plenty of resources out there where you can get all this information. But ultimately, you're going to have to put one foot in front of the other and take action um, to to achieve. You know whether you're renting to travel medical professionals, insurance companies, or long-term rentals, or Airbnb, 
you got to take action. And that's something that um, I learned in many areas of life, but specifically in real estate investing is you got to, you got to start. Uh, you're not going to learn. You're not going to truly learn anything unless you practice. Even doctors don't do that. They they go to school and then they go to residency before they're a real doctor or an attending physician. It's the same thing with their same logic with real estate investing. Yeah. So it's super true, man. And, and this is a thing that I that I talk to a lot of people about too. Is they're like, I want to start investing. I want to figure it out. Um, and I just want to jump into it. I'm like, whoa, whoa. whoa. You got to like analyze the numbers. You got to see what the market looks like. You have to look at trends. You have to look at, is there hospitals that are hiring in those markets? Is there indeed job postings? Is there, um, you know, what's the trajectory for the next five years? Is there baby boomers that are now aging in that population? And we know that now that there is, which is going to require more healthcare. Um, so all these stats are on government websites where you can actually check that out. And you can actually look at infrastructure jobs um, on the government uh, on the government website. And I'll post a link down below so you guys can actually go in and look at what uh, sectors are hiring certain people. Um, and that's a real good indication, an indicator on where the market's going to. So uh, Connor, I want to break into this since you've had, uh, and we'll talk about um, development here in a minute, but since you're a nurse, like what have you seen drop as far as rates go, like um, individual rates, like where were they at COVID and where are they at now? And where is the significance in that and where we are today? So I've seen during COVID, the most that I saw was like between seven and $10,000 a week. And that was, that was for six days in a week. So a lot, so that number reflects overtime as well, but those you nurses were able to work that much because there was a need right now. On a three-day contract in in San, the San Francisco Bay Area, which is a very which is probably the highest paying area for travel medical professionals, I'm seeing like three to four for three day a week contracts. Uh, that is significantly less uh, right now. A lot of times, staff nurses in the Bay Area are making as much or more as a travel nurse. It just comes down to ta- how taxes work essentially, which is why sometimes travel nurses will take more home, which is the appeal. So right now the the rates are 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 definitely less but the thing is is what I like about essentially providing housing for medical professionals is you're getting a certain clientele. And when you know your market, when you know what things rent for, what a furnished rental rents for as a one bedroom or as a two bedroom, uh, and you know what a nurse makes or what their spending threshold is, you you can you kind of reverse engineer it and make it so that your numbers still work despite the nurse making less, or you can pivot like we had discussed and go after insurance companies or go after uh, different medical or different professionals or go B2B and go straight to the agency and try to make relationships that way. So having those strategies, uh, like I'm still seeing the same returns personally as I did um, uh, during COVID. uh, And that's primarily because of how I, uh, how I rent my homes and, and, and the locations that they're in. Um, but I do say, I would say that you need to be extra careful when running your numbers, which is going to be one of the first things that you, that you do before even purchasing a property and getting it ready to, 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 uh, I guess, rent to a travel nurse. Got it. Yeah. And this is, this is one thing that I've, uh, when I was working directly with, um, you know, acquiring potential guests, like through Furnish Finder, um, or even Airbnb or VRBO, a lot of the clinicians are in per diem pain. We're going to talk about this for a second. Um, Per diem pay, for those of you who don't know, uh, nurses get untaxed, say, I'm just giving you an example right now, and Connor, you can break this down for me um, off of your expertise in this. Say it's $5,000 a month during COVID, and now the nurses potentially are getting like 3000 So can you tell us what has changed over the last two years and maybe even within the last year since you were with me as far as the per diem rates go and what per diem in- entails entirely so people understand that? Sure. So... Per diem and stipend, that those are the like they're the same thing. So per diem and stipend mean that depending on the area and the con- of the country that you're in, the staffing agency is allowed to give you X amount of dollars tax free uh, for your food and for your housing. And in like for example in San Francisco, I believe the stipend is around twenty five hundred dollars a week, and that's still that's still the case. So the agency is able to give you that amount of money tax free. However, let's say in North Carolina, I don't know what it is specifically, but um, the the cost of living is significantly less. So the company is only able to give you, we'll say like $1,500 a week tax-free. The thing is with the stipend, it's not necessarily that the stipend went down, it's that the hourly rate goes down. So the way that I'll break it down is this. So the hospital works with what's called a managed service provider, which is their agent. So think of like a sport, like a baseball player. They have an agent and then they negotiate with their team. So the hospital's agent is the MSP or managed service provider. And then the the nurse, their agent is their staffing agency. 
So the staffing agency and the managed service provider are talking and they say, all right, the, man, the hospital is going to pay $200 an hour per nurse. And then the agency says, great. So then the, the staffing agency says, all right, well, we, we need to take our cut. We have some expenses. So we're only going to pay the nurse $100 an hour. And then we have our costs, which roughly is $50 an hour. And then we're going to profit $50 an hour. So the nurse is still making that same $100 an hour. It's just a matter of what is allowed by the government in terms of what's being tax-free. But now what we're seeing is that because the COVID rates are dropping, the hospital is only paying $100 an hour. So then they talk to the agency and they're saying, well, we still need our our cut, our profit. So the nurse is, getting, is still probably getting the same amount of tax-free stipend, but their hourly is a lot less. Like my hourly at one point was $100 an hour plus the stipends uh, in, a, in San Francisco. So you make that sound bad. Yeah, no, it's 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 good money. <laughs> like a hundred dollars an hour. That's that's awful. <laughs> yeah. So that that was that was really good during COVID, but that's yeah. taxable yeah. income. So it yeah. all it all just depends. It's all just how taxes work, really. With that stipend, the pot of money is still the same, and the pot of money is definitely smaller now. But yeah, the thing is, is there's everyone nurses and and doctors still make good money, and their their budget, I found is is still good good for whatever they're willing to pay for housing. Um, so I, I, I still like that profile of person as my tenant. I had generally have less problems. I've tried Airbnb. I, I personally don't like it. That's not my strategy. Um, but, uh, it's not to say it's not a great strategy. It's just, I, I really like the pool of people that I find going after the corporate housing and the medical professionals rather than, um, people that I don't know their background and profile, um, with, uh, Airbnb. Yeah. And I totally agree with you on that. I just had somebody um, on, I'm actually going to be releasing a YouTube video on this. Actually, by the time this airs, that YouTube video will probably be out. Um, I literally had Connor probably like three grand or four grand worth of stuff stolen in my treehouse. I don't know if you've seen the treehouse that I just bought uh, okay. late last year. Somebody stayed for three days, four days there and literally just ripped off everything. Not one time over the last seven years with hosting travel medical professionals or even business travelers or corporate travelers have I ever had anything like that stolen. And they sold like dishes, um, rugs, Keurigs, like uh -huh. dude, everything, like everything that you would not expect somebody to steal, like they stole, which essentially we have to go back and replace those essentials. So never had that happen with travel medical professionals because they're just there to do a job uh -huh. and they're working majority of the time and they're chilling out when they're not working. Um, uh -huh. So it's a totally different type of clientele. So I want to, I want to touch base on something that you had mentioned a minute ago. So with the stipend amount that these nurses get, most of the time when you're directly booking a nurse from a platform, they're not going to want to spend as much money as an agency would per se, like if you're working with an agency. So that's, that's what I want everybody to realize here. Connor just like kind of nailed that. Say they are getting $10,000 a month in San Francisco. If I was a nurse, I'm not going to want to spend 10 G's on housing. Like I'm just not, um, I want to get the cheapest potential pro property or space so that I can, I can, uh, you know, be in that, in that property for whatever amount of time that I need to be at the lowest rate possible so that I can pocket the rest. And I think that's where people need to realize that if you're hosting a one-off nurse, they're going to be very frugal. Nine out of 10 times about spending, they're not going to want to spend $5,000 for your two-bedroom place. They're going to want to spend like, you know, $2,500. I'm just giving you an example. So can you talk about that a minute? Yeah, sure. So what I found uh, essentially is we all we all have a budget. And and generally for housing, I would say it's different in, in different areas of the country, but in the Bay Area, you know, some people pay five thousand a month in rent, and they're fine with that. Some people, you know, uh, if you're lucky, pay, I don't know, it's a thousand bucks a month for a room or something like that, and then you're in between. But the threshold of an individual, and and essentially the reliability of an individual, is a lot worse than a business. Businesses are mm -hmm. are backed by larger amounts of money, uh, and generally more credibility, especially if they've been more. I guess in in uh, in business for a longer period of time, insurance companies guys have the most insurance companies and banks have the most amount of money out of anyone. So if you can ever if you can essentially target the person or their company with the most amount of money, the chances of them not paying rent is is zero. Uh, the chances of an eviction happening close to zero. Uh, whereas a nurse, you know, you have a, you have a good kind of profile of a person, but they're, they're, they're spending what they're willing to spend is less, um, because they, you know, have, they, they have, they have a, they have a lot less money than, than a, than a child or than an insurance company or a, or a staffing agency. 
So um, kind of a strategy, I guess, that I use is to, to maximize my cash flow when I'm not able to find corporate housing is I, I find properties with basements and I kind of like I put I put kitchens and, and laundry rooms in them and I and they, it has to have a separate entrance. So I essentially make a duplex out of a single family home. And so that creates essentially, a, you know, a lot more cash flow out of that one house or one unit. Um, you need a little bit of money to kind of develop that that kind of a deal. But that's a, one of the ways that I create more cash flow if I can't find a business partner, which I would prefer. Yeah, I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But I just want everybody to realize right now, insurance companies have been around since literally 1752. In fact, Ben Franklin started one of the first insurance companies in the entire history of the U.S. in 1752. So these companies, insurance companies, have withstanded the the test of time, which that's how you know a you know banking industry and the insurance company they've been around for freaking ever. Um, and they're not going to go anywhere. And those are business models that we should look up to as investors or just entrepreneurs in general. Um, so I'm glad that you brought that up because, uh, again, I think the greatest play in real estate today is actually building a relationship with insurance companies and becoming their like go-to provider if somebody was to lose their property due to a fire or flood or some kind of um, you know awful event at their property. So um, you know my my school of thought has shifted, uh, Connor, in the last several years that I am now hosting more, um, you know, travel, excuse me, more of these insurance companies rather than travel nurses. Um, so it's kind of shifted. And I think that it's something to think about. Again, if I was only going after these eight, the, the travel nursing agencies and the nurses in general, we're seeing a shift in that happen. Um, I also still think it's a really good option, just like as you mentioned. And um, I want to touch on this too, uh, before we forget on this. Is there any trends that you're seeing right now with any of this stuff at all, especially being a, being a, a being a nurse, and then we'll kind of transition into uh, development and some of these other things that I think are going to be beneficial for people to hear about. Sure, Tre- trends in terms of what? Yeah, so like assignments, like what assignments have you been taking? Um, you know, wh- where where are like five areas that you've seen a lot of people heading to? Um, things of that nature, so that you can kind of let people can understand this a little bit more. First off, North Carolina has always been one of the places that I've seen that's been understaffed, underutilized for years now. Yeah. So there, there are truly travel nurse assignments all over the country. A lot of times, you know, the demographic of a travel nurse is probably between 20 and 40, most of them. Uh, so that with that being said, you, a lot, a lot of folks want to be in larger cities or more popular, popular and populated areas, but there are, I mean, there's plenty of them. There there's assignments in Hawaii, Alaska, New York city, San Francisco, and anywhere in between really, it just a, a matter of what the travel medical professional specialty is like mine is ICU. Well, I won't get hired as an OR nurse, even though I, you know, I'm well trained. So it really just depends on the need of the hospital. And I guess like similar to sometimes like insurance claims, like you don't really know necessarily like when it's going to happen or when there's going to be a need. That's not, that's not in my scope. That's, uh, you know, the, the hospital, um, administrators decide like what their, what their need is and what they're willing to pay. But right now, uh, what I will say is like there there is a seasonality to travel nursing sometimes. Spring and summer is a slower time. And that is also what we're seeing, I think, with the rates a little bit lower. Um, they generally pick up in in the fall and winter for for flu season. So um just I think with with the with the hospitals tightening their pocketbooks a little bit because of COVID the last few years, and also that we're headed into summer right now, uh there 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 may be less um less opportunities. And to be honest with you, one of the I guess things that I've recently done is I, I am what's called now a per diem nurse, and what that is different than the per diem that you and I were just discussing about stipends. Right. So, per diem mm-hmm. nursing means that I am now a part time nurse. I tell the hospital I I have to work four days a month. That's my commitment to them, and I get no benefits, um, and is. my hourly is higher because of that. So I I'm more transitioning in, into real estate now because of the the time flexibility it's it's certainly a lot of work but the cash flow that nursing provides me is still worth it uh i guess the intrinsic satisfaction that i'm helping someone it, and it and i am interested in healthcare so for now that's what i'm doing but the per the per diem element that i'm seeing at at this new hospital they're they're still using travelers and and they're and they're paying well um but sometimes hospitals are like their business 
personality is different. Like some hostels are really bad on the business side and willing to pay a lot. To, oh my God. To get Connor, to, yeah. I've, <laughs> sorry to cut you again. Yeah. I've, because I worked in healthcare for 17 years on the business development side. Mm -hmm. I covered all of California, um, down from SoCal to NorCal, as far as like hospitals and all these things. Um, I've never seen so many mismanaged hospitals in my entire life. Literally where a hospital was shut down, dead center in LA, and then all of a sudden they would be bought by like, say, Dignity Health. Yep. Literally within like a time frame. So whoever these hospital administrators are, you guys suck at doing, <laughs> doing business. Because like, I, I just, first off, they're charging an arm and a leg for toothpaste. I mean, the the healthcare system here is like charges tremendous, especially the pharmaceutical side. This is me not bashing uh, our our healthcare system. I, I guess I kind of am in a way uh, as a as a product of that. But man, I just, I don't understand how these hospitals can go out of, out of business. Not only that, but like there's certain patient to nurse ratios that there have to be in place. They're actually set through through legislation, le legislation not only uh, and their state level, you know, set, set ups, the way these things are done. Um, so that being said, you know, with assignments and things like that, um, are you seeing, and this is something I've been talking about a lot lately, a lot of nurses are wanting to leave the industry altogether because of burnout, because of fatigue, because of just being in the space for too long. First off, nurses are treated horribly by even their own employees. Like we look back at COVID, you didn't get a COVID jab and then all of a sudden you're now fired. Yeah. Um, so I think that the mentality, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, I talk to so many people, Connor, on a weekly basis, and a lot of them are healthcare workers, and they're just like, I'm burnt out. I'm actually looking at leaving this industry altogether, which is why I want to invest in real estate, which is why I want to go after travel medical professionals, which is why I want to still stay in the same kind of niche, but you know, house people now instead of actually being that worker. Mm -hmm. So are you seeing that now on your end? I mean, you're you're talking about leaving, exiting yeah. the healthcare. Yeah, so I'm just certainly seeing that the the what what people struggle with is is healthcare workers make good money and 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 that, I think that was a trend during COVID is is there's suddenly all these YouTube and Instagram stars who you know they they started at Airbnb and they quit their jobs it's like well the chances of them making you know sometimes ten twenty thirty thousand dollars a month at their job they it's it's a lot harder to replace that amount of income than than what the Instagram and YouTube stars during COVID were doing probably. Maybe yeah. maybe they were right. making that and they they got lucky, but that's the golden handcuffs of healthcare are real. That's one of the reasons why I'm still in it. But burnout's also yeah. real too. I'm burnt out. I've been a nurse for four years now, and I'm I'm go cool. I'm I'm on my way out. And one rental generally isn't gonna do it. And you tech and and what I would say to healthcare workers or or, or anyone experiencing burnout or anyone who's interested in getting into real estate investing in general is you one thing that's very very important is that when you apply for financing. At a bank, it is very important to sh be able to show income. And banks and you and 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 je and you probably know you can speak a little bit about this, but they view W two income a lot different than business income, especially when you have or or when you change jobs. And the financing aspect probably becomes harder. And you know, I'll kind of uh, like uh, I guess like let you talk about that now because you've gone through that uh, transition. Yeah, you know what, Connor, you brought up a really good point here. You can literally have a million dollars in the bank. Literally, like cash in the bank, and the bank will still not look at that as like this guy's qualified to buy a property. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can get a DSCR loan, which is basically a bank statement loan, but you can't get a conventional loan. So, and I did this wrong. I think the last time you and I talked, actually, that was one of my discussion points. Is like I shouldn't have quit my job. I just quit like on the whim um, when I should have actually thought it through and really thought about like, okay, I need to keep my W two, and I'm going to advocate for quitting right away. I, I think that people should really plan things out. Right. Um, you know, a plan, a plan is like literally one of the most important things of starting any business. You can't just leave something right away. So that was something that, um, I did wrong. So you're right. Yeah. So anybody out there that's wanting to quit their job, like be very thoughtful, um, and set a plan and set a time and really think about that W2, uh, and that income before you decide to leave, mm -hmm. start your business today and start generating some sort of income today, because it's going to help you in the long run. I think you need to have two years of actual legitimate uh, you know, income coming in for that business for it to qualify for a conventional loan. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely something to think about. Um, so speaking of the, I don't want to, I don't want to jump off too much off topic right now. Um, I've had doctors reach out to me, actually resident doctors on Instagram and say, Connor, this is not even kidding you. Like, Hey, I'm in my last year of my residency. Like, I don't even want to go into healthcare. I'm finishing this up. Like I want to start creating an exit today. Like literally people have messaged me this on, on Instagram, uh -huh. doctors, residents that are like literally going to school for seven years. Uh -huh. Um, 
And actually, uh, Forbes recently had a study that is one in four clinicians is expected to leave the healthcare industry by 2025. Uh-huh. Um, so this is a question that I that that a lot of people have been bringing to me, and I'm sure you've heard. Um, are hospitals now not hiring clinicians like they once were? Is there is that something we should be worried about? Is for if we're going after this market? Uh, I don't think they can. There's a shortage. So, you know, the, you can never plan, you cannot plan your patient census. So that means like you cannot plan how many patients are going to be in the hospital at any one time. So sometimes it's low and sometimes it's high and hospitals certainly do their best to plan and, and, and essentially staff as low as possible. Cause guys, you got to remember hospitals are a business. They want to run short because they have to, that means they pay less benefits. They pay less dollars out. So there, there is a need and they're trying to balance it, but it's impossible that there's no way to balance essentially patient census. So essentially, I think that they would like to not hire as many clinicians, but I, I think there's going to be more yeah. of a shortage because of the burnout. And also um, there's way easier ways to make way more money. And like, I think becoming a doctor or a nurse or, or a lawyer, it's very important and admirable. But the one of the most important things that I've learned through real estate investing is uh, you, time, time is money, and 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 the time flexibility that real estate provides is is unparalleled. It's much different, and you certainly, if you're interested in in medicine or in nursing or in healthcare in general, do it because you're not going to be happy if if you're if you're doing something you don't want to do. But I would say that real estate investing, regardless of your interest in it or not, is very valuable and and essentially necessary to build wealth in your lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. And I think that now, you know, after all these years that, you know, investing in real estate is kind of like cool now. It's like one of the cool things to do. In fact, I see more people now, Connor, that are younger that are getting in the space. Like, you know, there's a girl that we're going to have on the the big break podcast that I have. Uh, she's yeah. 17 years old and owns 900,000 worth of real estate already. Wow. Like creative finance. Yeah. 17 years old. Sure. Um, and it, it's crazy for me to think about because I've never, I never thought about real estate like that until actually I was in my uh, late or mid thirties already before I f- picked up my first property. So if I would have started earlier, Connor, like imagine if you started when you were like in your early 20, actually, you're probably like 21 years old. What am I talking no, about? Right now? I'm old now. I'm 30. <laughs> oh man, get out of here. You're still <laughs> no. a child. So yeah, I mean that, that's like, that's such a good age and Connor, you started early, man. So kudos to you for like having the mindset first off, um, to be able to in, start investing in yourself and in your future and, you know, really thinking about that. And you're right. Going back to what you talked about earlier, Healthcare is one of those golden handcuffs uh, situations. Like me personally, I was making over two hundred thousand a year, um, you know, working in the industry, and it was it was great. And a lot of clinicians are busting their ass, making you know probably even less than that in, in a lot of places. Um, and the, those conditions aren't the greatest, and, and there's just a lot of factors that come along with it. But to to reiterate the question that you or the statement that you just said earlier, I too feel that the travel medical professionals are. Um, there's going to be more a need. There's going to be a higher need in the future, especially right now. Baby boomers are getting to the age where they're requiring more healthcare. We're seeing a higher uh, percentage of um, patients that are, have like CHF and COPD at a younger age, um, especially compared to the Bay Area to the Central Valley where I'm at. When I worked in both areas, <laughs> our average age patient with CHF was like 54 years old in the Bay Area. It was in the 70s, which is weird. <laughs> um, so we were starting to see these different trends happening with younger people. Um, and that's just probably can goes back to the American diet and how people eat and, you know, smoking and drinking and all those other things. But I don't want to go down that rabbit hole too much. But I know that I do feel that um, even though we're having more longevity as humans, there is still like certain markets and certain areas that have a higher density for people that just aren't necessarily following the right. Um, you know, they're just following the wrong diets, you know, the very American culture diet. Um, and I think that plays plays a, a big part in it. But again, going back to what I was talking about a minute ago there's still a lot of opportunity in this space. So I don't want everybody to feel like this is doom and gloom. We're not going to be able to have this industry anymore. Travel medical professionals are leaving. I think now you just have to be more creative on who you're going after. In fact, uh, we're going to talk about development here for a second. Um, and Connor, do you want to talk about development? And I'll, I'll kind of break into what I'm doing right now. And I think that what you're doing, what I'm doing is probably going to be similar in a lot of ways. So let's let's talk about your development. So Connor does something really cool. And I've only seen a couple other investors do this. Um, where they'll actually buy single family homes or say bigger properties and, and turn them into multi-unit properties. So can you kind of walk us through what a deal would look like if you were to, you know, buy a, a single family that say, like, how many square footage are you looking at? What's the bedroom type? How are you splitting that? What does the lot line need to look like? Can you kind of break that down to, sure. you know, how you're going to do that? So what I, first of all, one of the things that I look at is location. And 
guys, everyone is uh, in uh, a lot of people that I encounter in California. That's like, well, where can I invest? And they want to go out of state. And location is truly the most important thing of anything. You can you can change you can change anything about a property except its location. So that is what I would say to target, uh, I guess most. And that location should be an area that you yourself would want to live in, and it should be within like ten to twenty minutes of the hospital or university. Those are the, that's kind of the area that I target. And then from there, I look for properties with basements, specifically walkout basements. So that means that essentially two or three of the four walls have windows, but it's still a basement. So that is helpful for me on the purchase price because when I buy it, it they you can't count that square footage as is as valuable or as valuable as the true above ground square footage. But to a person, it functions as, you know, a single, single story kind of area. So you get the sunlight in. Then um I kind of look at well, I I have li- a little bit of construction background, so I you need to understand like eventually like water walls, and that's something where you know if there's a for example a bathroom above uh, above an area, you have access to water or piping so that you can have water come down to it, and you're not plumbing across the whole house to get this bathroom where you want it. So that is that's kind of like an aside piece, but but pretty important in terms of your budget um, when you're putting in these kitchens and bathrooms. There's really no true like square footage. Uh, Mine mine are like 1750 to 3000 square feet. Um, These are all in the South as well. So the pricing is a lot different than here in California in terms of what it costs me to buy it and also what it costs me to have people work on those properties. Um, But uh, from there, guys, it's real. You have to also shift your mindset when you're developing because this isn't a place for you. This is a place for other people. So uh, you need to make it a space that ev- that the most amount of people will like and that is going to stand out from your competition or your other the other rentals in the area. So. Uh, That is going to be a later phase, in my opinion, like the design aspect, that's like the last thing. Uh, In terms of the the development aspect itself, it's not your house, guys. If there's a water wall, if there's an option to have the, the, the bathroom on a water wall, but it's closer to the front door and you don't like it, you would rather it be at the back, it doesn't matter. The bathroom is going at the front door because it's going to cost you $20,000, $30,000, $40,000 to plumb it to the other side don't do that um so um the i guess the back end of this guys the reason why development is is becoming important to me is because of the tax advantages to it and and when you become a business owner um as specifically a real estate professional that is a topic we could make a whole other video about but that status is what allows me to do what i am doing if you're a lawyer a doctor you can you have to either be married to someone who is a real estate professional or uh, or quit your job and become one yourself. But essentially, <laughs> cool. essentially that status is is what allows me to do this. The development, you could spend, let's say, a couple hundred thousand building this house in in money that is uh, financed from the bank. Let's say you made two hundred and fifty as a realtor or a property manager or a contractor. You could actually write off that 250 in construction costs because it's a loss but you just made you just created an appreciating asset asset and forced the value of that so that's how the super super wealthy and like don't pay taxes but you Frame. you have to be a real estate professional there's strategies that we could like i said make all other video about but my strategy Frame. with the development is i'm i'm developing it to create those write-offs for myself but i'm and I'm also making a single family home, a triplex or a quad, and I'm also doing the furnished rental. So I'm forcing my rents up by making the leases shorter. And then I'm uh-huh. forcing the appreciation because I just renovated a hundred thousand dollar house and I made it right. like six fifty or seven hundred. And then I also don't pay taxes. So yeah. you have to think about as you as this is not so that's not a beginner level thing, but that's kind of how right. I'm, I'm incorporating midterm rentals with development because as you make more money there's no i mean sure maybe there are some businesses where you have that many write-offs 
but like real estate is truly a way to have massive amounts of write-offs, which is essentially what Donald Trump does to not pay taxes. But people in California don't like to talk about that. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And there, there's, and it's not just Donald Trump that doesn't pay taxes. There's a lot of yeah. people that don't pay taxes. Um, there's a lot of ways to, to, to use cost segregation for sure. this, these, these specific things. And I'll make a video or we'll talk about that another time where we go and break down and maybe I'll even like show you guys real life examples of my properties that I have where I'm not paying, you know, a substantial amount of taxes uh, based off of cost segregation and things like that. But yeah, that's, you're absolutely right on that end. So one of the other things too is, is, you know, I, I think that, and I've talked about this before, and this is where I did things wrong, Connor, and I've talked about this in the past, is that I bought a bunch of single family homes instead of uh, diversifying my portfolio earlier. And this is where a lot of people like you and like people like David Green um, will buy a single family home and convert it into a multi-unit property or like somewhere that has two doors on that one pro on that one lot line. Um, and that's that, and they're still using the same uh, structure of the house, but turning it into multiple different doors if the city allows the permitting on it. So um, I think that's a great strategy, especially in places like the Bay Area, um, especially in places like New York that are urban Chicago that are, they, that are a little bit more expensive, but you're able to add your value adding to that property. And not only that, but you're able to have more doors with literally essentially just buying one property yep. and then doing some rehab to get it together. And that's where I screwed up was I bought single family homes and now barely Connor I'm getting to the stage now where I'm going to start uh, creating and developing or buying multi-unit properties, you know, 20 plexes and things like that, uh -huh. and turning those into like travel nurse havens, like travel nurse areas where we have like a communal area where all the nurses can hang out and we get contracts with the company and we're actually flipping the NOI on what that property was making before and maybe 2Xing or even 3Xing what it was doing as a traditional long-term rental. Sure. So I think these strategies in real estate are going to start becoming more prominent, especially now as interest rates are going up. Connor, it's hard for me to find a deal right now that make the pencils in as a long-term rental. Um, and I think as the rates continue to go up, we're going to see this, you know, happen for the next couple of years, potentially. Um, we don't have a crystal ball to say that, but I think for me, you're going to start seeing more people think in real estate as more of a business, which you brought up a minute ago. Um, and I think that's the best and the smartest way in the intentional way to build wealth and to build a business that you can sell your tangible assets, which is your real estate, and then also sell your business if you want to later on. Because those things are are connected, but they're not. You can have a real estate business that is entirely about outsourcing companies, creating contracts with travel nursing companies or hospitals directly. Um, then you can have the real estate. So those things can be sold separately or together um, and can be equal in value depending on how you look at it. So I think there's so much opportunity in this space. And again, right now is like people are having to get creative with real estate. And if you're not being creative, if you're not pivoting, you're stuck in a spot where you could potentially be losing money and you don't want to have that uh -huh. in any market. Obviously there's cycles through everything, right? This could be a cycle that could last for five years. We don't know. We don't know how long this is going to last. So it's incredibly important right now, everybody listening to us to be intuitive, to, to forward think, to think around the bend, um, to skate to where the puck is going and not necessarily wait to wait two years to get there. Like right now, start thinking intuitively. So, uh -huh. um, okay. So one of the things that I want to bring up here, Connor, before we, before we jam out of this, this segment, um, Three things that you would consider doing if you were starting from scratch today, having the understanding as a travel nurse, having the understanding of a real estate investor, which you're almost like one of those unicorns where there's not a lot of people that understand these two these two angles. So three things you would do right now if you were getting started with no properties at all. Like what would what would the first one be? So first thing and what uh, what I t what I tell everyone is focus on making money. You cannot, it is very, very hard. There, there are plenty of people on social media who, who will tell you, you know, I did this with no money. It is very hard to do that. And I don't necessarily believe that. Get a job and focus on earning as much money as you can, because ultimately you're going to need financing and you should get financing and use as much as other of other people's money as possible. Um, preferably the bank, because the interest rates will probably be lower than a person or hard money. But uh, with you having, with you having enough money, you are mitigating your risk, and you're also able to qualify for financing. So I'd say that's number one. Um, number two, um, educate yourself. Practice on on Redfin or Zillow or whatever you use on finding those properties in a market that you know. Don't look at some market in out of state because you live in San Francisco and it's too expensive here. And you've never been to Ohio, but somebody on social media said Ohio is good. Uh, go to <laughs> yeah. look at a market that you know, and you know those locations because the location is what matters. I can't go. I'm experienced, but I don't know uh, Seattle and I don't know Wyoming. So 
If you know that, you probably do better than I would there because you know the locations. I don't. You know you have, know the contractors of the hand event. I don't really have an interest in building a team there. So if you have a, a competitive advantage, look at those areas and practice on, on Redfin or Zillow, picking, picking a home and, and thinking about what you would do to it based on the, the Zestimate and, and what you see that those numbers spit out in terms of what your monthly payment is. Practice running those numbers. And I would say like generally buffer, I'm going to say $1,000 for maintenance, um, maintenance uh, taxes and insurance in addition to what the Zestimate or Redfin uh, payment spits out at you. Um, number three, uh, I would say look at properties with with basements or edus or cottages things that you can make other units out of because like i said what i do is i create duplexes with the walkout basements and one of the cool things that i did, don't know if i mentioned before is i in order to, to make it a duplex i all i have is like an exterior door at the top of the stairwell from the basement to the uh -huh. level that you know if i want to I can just open that door, rent it to a family for the insurance company, and then they just have two kitchens and two laundry rooms. But if it's, if mm -hmm. I have to go towards a, essentially two travel medical professionals that are different, I just shut the door and now I have a duplex uh -huh. that I can force cash flow that way. So if you can start thinking Brand. creatively and looking, looking at buildings or houses, ways that other people aren't, because you, when you have to think about like when you're, when you're looking at single family homes, you're competing with the average family or like the average person who's looking to live there themselves. When you're when right. you get into multifamily, you're looking at other other investors and other uh, like uh, essentially creative and, and, and innovative people or financially motivated people are looking at that. And they're running their own numbers, and your competition is greater with people that you don't necessarily want to be competing with. So when you're hey. uh, especially as a beginner, so if you if you're able to essentially be more creative than the average Joe who just wants to live there themselves, you can also you're you're, you're your cost is going to be less and your and your and your potential cash flow will be more if you pick the right property so thinking creatively like that is is very important uh potentially reaching out to some contractors and getting some bids you can do that if you want but i would say really focus on um getting a job where you're making good money and you can afford something that's number 1 and then picking a property and and when you're actually ready to get a property get a free qual letter like don't call a realtor realtor first. Like you need to have, you need to know what yeah. you can afford and no realtor. You don't want to waste anyone's time. You need that let So you can practice calling banks and, and going through that process if you want. It's not, it's like a soft hit on your credit, but you need to know what you can afford um, when you're, when you're looking at these properties. So, so without that, you can't make offers and you don't even really know what, what you're going to be allowed to buy. So that would be, I guess, a part of step number three as well. Yeah. Yeah. Those are all solid. I think really thoughtful things to think about. Um, especially the one that you just talked about. I think a lot of times people are like, I want to buy a property and they're going to call it an agent first. And then they're not going to actually, you know, find out if they qualified. Yeah. The agent's going to say, Hey, do you have a prequal letter? And then you got to get a prequalification letter. So, um, yeah, there's a whole thing behind that, but I do still feel, and this is the question that I'm going to ask you right now. Would you, if you were starting today, would you still house travel medical professionals? Given what you just talked about earlier, we're talking about potentially the market shifting or potentially uh, nurses leaving the industry, which I don't think that's that's happening or it's going to happen. I think, it, again, we're going to need more of that. Would you still go after travel medical professionals? Yes, I would because I like that. I like that profile of person. Um, there is, like, to, to be honest, there is more money in, in, in the B2B side and, and in the insurance side. And I, I'm totally yep. transparent about that. Um, and I do still go after those, but I feel like the, for, for me, at least with my business right now, that is, it is less reliable. Those, the, the B2B and the insurance are less reliable. So you need to have multiple strategies so that your bottom line is covered. That's another, so essentially if, if there's no insurance claims out and you, and you can't get a, a insurance claim in theaters to rent it for max rent, you need to be able to cover your costs in, at least, and then hopefully still be making a lot of money with travel medical professionals. So you need to be able to, you know, pivot in multiple different directions um, when things happen. Because as we've seen over the last four years with COVID, with interest rates, um, you know, with the stock market, like things that things are things move, whether you whether you're moving or not, things are moving around you. So you need to be able to cover your costs. And one of the things also that goes back to when you're purchasing a property 
depends on your market, but really think, I mean, don't buy, don't buy something in, in a place where you could buy a house for a hundred thousand or less. That's not going to be conducive to housing insurance claims or medical professionals because those homes probably, uh, you wouldn't want to live there yourself. So yeah. you need to be purchasing properties probably between, I would say, uh, two to 400 and that depends on your market, but um, that's kind of where I found a good sweet spot in terms of I can keep my costs low, even on a long-term rental, I would still make money. So if I do Airbnb or midterm or B2B or insurance claims, I'm making a lot more money, but in a worst case scenario, my risk is very low. That's something that I would also consider when buying a property. Um, but you mitigate that risk by your own cash flow, by your job, which is what I said step one was. So, um, those are just kind of additional additional pointers. Yeah, no, I think you're I think you're spot on with that. Um, and again, I think the takeaway from this call or this this you know this video today is don't put all your eggs in one basket. The yeah. healthcare industry is still strong despite what you're seeing on headlines and news articles and other things like that. Um, Connor is a travel nurse, you know, or not anymore. You're a per diem nurse now. Per diem nurse um, now, yeah. Yeah, so he's not he's no longer a traveler, but you have that experience and you understand it and you 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 get it from that perspective. And you dropped some really important things today. You're talking about, you know, the uh the industry as far as like what the agency does, what the hospitals are doing and how you're in between. You're basically, you know, you have like a like a baseball player agent that's essentially marketing and trying to get, you know, these funds for you. And part of the hospital gets those funds too. I think a lot of times people don't realize that that once Connor gets paid as a travel nurse, the hospital makes a portion of that income too. Um, I don't I don't know if people necessarily knew that or not. So yeah, Connor, where can folks find you at? If we're if they're looking for you on Instagram or YouTube, where where can folks find you? Sure. So on, on Instagram, you can find me at Connor C O N N O R underscore Mather, M A T H E R. Um, and you can just give me a follow. I'll follow you back. You feel free to shoot me a message. I'll answer any questions you have uh, or could set up a call. I'm I try to make myself available. Um, and then I'm also going to yeah, the midterm rental summit uh later this month in San Diego. So, you know, I I hope to see you all there. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about that, man. I think there's going to be a lot of people since this industry is so small. Um, well, so new it's, I mean, I guess it's not necessarily new. It's been around for a while, but there's a lot of people that are probably doing really big things that we don't even know about yet um, mm -hmm. that are doing things even on a higher scale than we can even think of. And I'm excited to be able to network with those people, but then also be able to give information for people that are starting off. I mean, imagine Connor, if we had a midterm rental summit when you were starting off in this space, like where you can get together and network with people and actually, you know, have conversations and potentially be doing deals. I mean, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for investors that are there. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for, um, you know, people that are just starting off. So I'm excited to be at that summit, man. I appreciate you for being there. And everybody, go give a follow to Connor over on the gram. And uh, thanks for being here, man. I appreciate you taking the time for round number two with yeah. uh, me here. And I appreciate you all. So if you all could please like and subscribe to my page, it would really, really help me, especially with the algorithm. And who doesn't love an algorithm that's being helped a certain degree, right, Connor? Yeah, yeah I mean, that's, come on. Certain, that's right. So cool. All right, everybody. Well, thanks. Have a great rest of your day, and we will see you soon.